Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a wonderful guest on today who might look familiar. We have the amazing Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hello. <laughs> you may remember Melissa from an episode a couple weeks ago, which is still doing very well. A lot of people are watching this because it was an amazing episode. And she was one of our favorite friends and guests that we have on. And we have invited her back on today because this is sort of a spur of the moment episode. Wouldn't you say, Landon? Oh, yes. We just put this together in the last 24 hours, I think. <laughs> we did. We're on the cutting edge, current events, something happens. We are on it. We are on the spot. This is awesome. Mormonish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we came across something um, in social media in the post-Mormon world that we just had to address. And it's interesting because today is June 1st. That's when we're recording. And so it's the beginning of... Pride month. Pride month. Woo! Pride month. Oh wow, Melissa, I love your shirt. That's amazing. That you look fun? fabulous. Yeah, that is really fun. I love it. And I understand that you just wore that to a um, Faithful Ward book club. Is that right? That you're a yes, part of? and they were absolutely lovely. Like they. Well, there it is. Absolutely lovely about it. Zero judgments. It was great. I love it. I love it that you're, you know, you belong to an atheist book club. You belong to our good book club. You belong to your award book club. You're perfect. You're just very eclectic, which is wonderful. I think that's what we all should be. So anyway, so we came across, um, it was actually, um, well, why don't we just pull up the first slide and we'll start talking about it because it's very interesting. The first day of pride month, um, this video, this very interesting video dropped yesterday so um, I don't know if you, our viewers, are familiar with FAIR. It used to be called FAIR Mormon. It's now FAIR Latter-day Saints. Landon, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the FAIR conference is before we dive into this? Yeah, so FAIR was founded in uh, 1997, so it's been around like 25 years now. And it's basically the church's apologist website where you can go and uh, ask questions or seek questions, and they try to give a faithful answer to some of the church's questions. Uh, tough questions. Uh, actually, one of the founders was a uh, uh, backyard professor, Kerry Schertz, that we've been on several of his shows. We're doing some series with him. He was actually one of the first three founded. There was three people who founded it, and he was one of those. Um, he since left as he tried to answer the questions. <laughs> it began to raise some <laughs> it was questions. Bound to happen. <laughs> so, yep, bound to happen. Uh, also, uh, Nathan that we had on our show. Nathan Smith, um, yes. Yeah, Nathan he was Smith. a very young apologist very for Bear, young. like age 16, yep. very, very young. And then, of course, our other favorite, RFM. RFM so, you'll notice that a lot of the top podcasters in the post Mormon world. We're originally fair apologists. Isn't that interesting? Those were those three are the ones because I love all three of those guys. Yeah, like, isn't that funny? Yeah, and a lot of others too. But it's funny how many have kind of you know thought themselves, questioned themselves out of fair and are now podcasting for the post Mormon world. So, yeah, and, and what I thought it was very interesting the acronym for fair it changed recently. Why don't you tell us, Landon, what it used to be and what it is now? Because I think that kind of speaks a lot to what's yeah, going on over there. Be fair Mormon, and it sounded very academic it actually stood yes. for foundation for apologetic information and research wow, so okay. it was a group for apologetics that they would search for answers and and try to give you know faithful responses to a lot of the question concerns uh they've since changed it and fair now stands for faithful answers informed responses wow. sounds sounds more like excuses almost. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like now well, now well, landed but they're not <laughs> Correct answers, but they're faithful answers. They're faithful they're answers. Informed yep. responses. You know, they may not be accurate, but at least you're informed when you're given an answer to it. So uh, uh, it, there it you seems go. a little simplified. But they have a conference. They do a conference every year with the trying to do the apologetics, and that's what this conference was. This was actually the talk was from last year. Conference. That's right. The talk was actually given in 2022, and they just released this particular talk from the conference. From what I can tell, they just released it yesterday because it says on the site, please join us for 2023. So I think sort of like an advertisement, like look at what we talked about last year. This year is going to be even better. Come and join us. So they dropped this the day before the beginning of Pride uh, Month. So the title of this talk, um, which was at the FAIR conference last year, is Teaching and Communicating the Doctrine of the Family to the Rising Generation, the Power of Combining Scripture, Scholarship, and Storytelling by Carol Rice. 
from our 2022 FAIR conference. So that is what this address is taken from. And let's find out a little bit more about our presenter who's actually giving the talk before we dive in. Landon, do you want to read her bio very quickly? Sure. Carol Rice is the president of Skyline Research Institute and the director of communications for Public Square Magazine, a joint project for the Elizabeth McCune and Johnny Whitson Foundation. As a communication, marketing, and outreach director over the past two decades, she's provided specialized communication and mes messaging training for nonprofits and non-governmental organizations, including at the United Nations. She has worked extensively with prestigious storytelling organizations, including the Timpanoga Storytelling Institute, the National Storytelling Network, and the International Storytelling Center. Carol earned a BA in Marriage and Family Relations with an emphasis in family advocacy from BYUI. Yeah, so a very interesting presenter. And now this talk was over 40 minutes long, but we are going to focus on a particular story that she told at the very end of the talk. And before we get to that exactly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, if we can go back to the other slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, sort of the gist of the rest of the talk. We are going to link it so that you can listen to it for yourself if you'd like to. But her focus is on storytelling and teaching through storytelling, like the title of the talk. And so basically the concept was um, they talked about kids, young people leaving the church quite a bit, especially college age and maybe even really gravitating away in high school, but then finding the freedom to leave in college. Um, they talked about what can we do about that, these, these young people that are leaving. And they definitely focused on the idea that instead of just hitting kids with facts or scriptures or information like that, the best way to reach them is to tell them a story that will teach them something, a moral, a parable, a subtle way of getting your point across or your agenda across. <laughs> so as you can see from her bio, I know that was snarky. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> as you can see from her bio, you know, she, she is an expert storyteller and she, I believe, holds workshops to help others learn how to craft stories, personal narratives about their own life. So this talk was all about how to have maybe the hard conversations with kids, especially focusing on the information in the proclamation for the family and what they kept calling the divine the divine construct sort of, of of gender and family and male female roles. So of course these are difficult topics to bring up in society today. And so basically the way to do it, um, according to this talk, is to just tell these stories with morals that kind of get your point across and will be remembered more clearly than just some facts or statistics. And, and they also had a little discussion about, you know, um, neuroscience and how your brain remembers stories and how your brain reacts, which I think is all, all true. I'm on board with storytelling. I do that quite a bit. <laughs> and, and of course, we've all been, when we used to go to church, when somebody would get up and tell a story, you remember that much more than just somebody that's reading a talk or, you know, just quoting some scriptures. So the basis of the talk is that, but definitely a very heavy emphasis on how to help these children and these young adults understand the true meaning and importance of the proclamation to the family and everything within it. So at about minute 30 or so, maybe 35, she launches into this story, which we, we have the direct transcript and we're just going to kind of read through it, there we are back to the, the title of the talk. So now we're going to go. Mouse <laughs> is behaving poorly. Well, it's okay. It's all right. It's Pride Month. The mouse is going crazy. It's a so. rainbow. I'm not it's lying. A it's a rainbow, rainbow mouse. Is it really a rainbow mouse? It, I love it really that. is. Look at, well, yeah, you can't see it. You can but show it, it if you it can. Glows, it glows uh, <laughs> blue and pink. and Only yeah, Melissa would have mouse. a rainbow mouse. I love it. Okay. All things pride so, all the time. So we'll launch into this story that she told um, at the very, very last part of her talk. So we're just going to kind of read through it section by section and kind of discuss it. So she starts out by saying, a colleague shared with me a story that illustrates the delicate balance that Nathan and Jalari spoke of. Now, these are other people that joined her for her talk, and they also continued that same theme of how to have these hard discussions through storytelling um, with, with kids to get this information across. So, And if you watch the link, you'll see them, them talk. So Nathan and Jalari spoke of 
being compelled as disciples of Christ to love others enough to share the truths that will bless their lives. So the truths they're talking about may be considered the harder things that in society today, it's hard to teach your kids. So any thoughts about this very first uh, part of her story that she's going to tell? Yeah, the thing that caught my eye is uh, the fact that it starts off with a colleague shared with me. Yes, It's not a personal story, so she doesn't have the exact facts. This appears to be a third-hand story. Um, a lot of the people, as we watched, uh, as we looked at some of the comments on this, were saying, I don't know if this is a true story or not. And when you make it a third party uh, or, you know, third removed from the story, yes. it's very difficult to yeah, track down and see, is this true or not? Because you're just not given enough facts. Uh, so I thought that was interesting that she started it out with, you know, making it a third hand story rather than a personal uh, story that might have some actual experience with. I don't know, Melissa, did you have any thoughts on it? Or I do. I do. I'm compelled. Being compelled as disciples of Christ. Mm -hmm. it, um, it implies that if you are not telling people this truth if you are not sharing these things you're not doing it right because you're compelled as a disciple of christ this is what you're supposed to be doing so if you're not doing it you're doing something wrong right compelled as a disciple of christ you're doing what's right so if you're not doing it it implies that the behavior you're not loving enough you're not missionary enough you're not doing what you need to be doing and it's so it's just kind of uh, i don't know a word it's just really, really gross <laughs> you, you can just say i have no words that's okay it's, to it's say just sometimes. gross <laughs> gross Ooh, is Melissa, the word Melissa cho chose the word gross okay so gross. this is the beginning of the talk uh that we need to you know we just got to do do our duty and we got to we got to talk about these hard topics so let's dive right into the story Landon do you want to read the first slide here we go we're compelled to dive into this story <laughs> we're compelled to dive into the story yes from our convictions we are compelled go ahead <laughs> A young woman in her 20s joined the church, but soon after, along with another single adult woman in their YSA ward, began to identify as males with dressing, grooming, and using pronouns to match. When learning about patriarchal blessings, she desired to receive one. The bishop interviewed her about her desire, prepared to recommend, and submitted it to the stake patriarch. So that's the beginning of the story. And when we were going over this, Melissa had some very strong opinions on even just this. <laughs> hold it together, Melissa. <laughs> even this very first paragraph. Uh, yeah, exactly. There you go. Zen moment. So, yeah. What are your thoughts on even just that very first part of the story? So um, for me, I have come to understand how intensely, intensely people feel about the pronouns that they use to identify themselves. And so if this um, young person is choosing to use pronouns that identify them as in this, according to this, as he, him, is what it, it sounds like what they're saying. If this person is choosing to use he, him, to then say a young woman in her 20s joined mm -hmm. another woman, mm -hmm. like it's so dismissive of how that person is choosing to identify because it's so critical to how we see ourselves the pronouns that people use for us it's so critical that we're respectful of them and so this whole first paragraph I was just like nails on a chalkboard for me because I was like that's not what this person wants to have as their pronouns and you're completely dismissing what his desires what his wishes are by using her by using woman I mean, mm -hmm. oh, it just she, it, on it me. says it several times all through it. Exactly. It dismisses the entire concept behind it right away. What do you think, Landon? Uh, I think they say, you know, that in her 20s, join the church. Maybe we should say the Mormon church. And that kind of shows you when you <laughs> use a different <laughs> topic. Right. Good one, topic Landon. The wow. Way the one you have it used. Uh, it would be the same. Yep. Um, to me, it, it's interesting that the bishop in this case, uh, seems to be a very uh, honorable, he, he sees someone who wants to have the blessing, he, uh, uh, he takes him, he interviews him, and he, he says, let's go to the stake patriarch and mm -hmm. get you a blessing, it's something you desire. 
So that's that's so true. It says he interviewed her, prepared the recommend and submitted it. It didn't say he questioned her about her dress and grooming. He questioned, right. you know, about it didn't say all that, that, he, that right. he was like getting on this young adult about it. Right. I have, <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to say she, because I, I mean, I know that, and, oh, sorry, good. I know. Well, the story goes on and that's why we're kind of confused in what we're saying, but um but well-intentionedly, of course. So, and I think this is a case of Bishop Roulette, obviously, because it seems like oh, just yeah. a no-brainer here. He accepts this young adult for whom this young adult is and understands that this young adult deserves and desires a patriarchal blessing and is ready to go ahead and help facilitate that. So let's go to our next slide and we'll have Melissa read that one. Okay. As is common in preparing members for receiving their patriarchal blessings, the state patriarch provided some information to prepare for the event that included, because of the spiritual nature of the blessing, you should do everything possible to prepare yourself and lift yourself from worldliness. Approach the day with the same spirit you would want with you if you were attending the temple, by spiritually preparing and wearing the same type of clothes as you would if you were going to the temple. Hmm. And I guess maybe that's, I'm trying to think, my sons have had, it's been a while since they've had their blessings. I guess maybe that's just standard. There's a little list of instructions that you go like over church dress. for somebody. Yeah, church best dress and and not worldly, maybe fast and pray the day before. I think I remember things like that. So the stake patriarch is just saying to this individual person that you're going to want to do these things to prepare and especially wearing the same type of clothes as you would as if you were going to the temple. What do you think, Landon? It, it, it strikes me here uh, at one, they, he said, and lift yourself from worldliness. Why is dressing in a nice suit and a dress lifting yourself from worldliness? It would seem that if you wanted to, you know, remove yourself from worldliness, you, you know, sackcloth and, and uh, something like that, you know, that would, that would show that you're not worldly. Uh, I, I don't know where this idea that you must wear a suit uh, and a, a white shirt and a tie. I mean, you know, they say because it's a spiritual experience, did, you know, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, when he was having, going through the atonement, was he wearing a white shirt and tie because it was a spiritual experience? I, I don't think so. Where, yeah. uh, I know where it comes from. I know exactly where it comes from. And first I'll say, when we read Reza Aslan's Zealot, that was one of the most interesting things in the book is they said that Jesus literally, back in the day, people would wear an undergarment and then an over tunic. And in this book, it says Jesus literally ran around in his undergarment, which yeah. is why he stood out. And he was seen as just this, you know, wild breaking all the boundaries, all the social mores, because he wasn't really even fully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was in Ray's book. Anyway, I will tell you, and I think people have heard this before, where the white shirt and tie comes from, and also the feminine attire, the dress, because the church is trapped in 50s business attire and culture. You know that. That's yes. exactly what it is for some reason. And maybe it's because leadership, you know, that's the era that they were in. But to them, that means respect, reverence. It means decorum. It's the 50s business attire and culture where they're trapped like a time warp. <laughs> yeah, no, it seems like from going to the temple that the, you know, uh, when Adam and Eve, you know, were in front of God, they were completely naked. And that, that seemed to be the preferred way until they sinned. And he said, oh, you've got to cover yourself with these, you know. with." Right. And who said that? Who said you've got to cover yourself? Yes. Uh, well, Satan. And then they made exactly animals. Yes. Yeah, so. I'm just saying that that's a whole other episode. That a whole, whole other episode. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so this young person has gone to the patriarch, all stars in their eyes, and they're excited to get their blessing, and they're told the things that they're going to have to do. So, all can right, you let's imagine as a oh. convert, if you're told as a convert, you can get this blessing where God yeah. is speaking yeah. directly to you. How excited! Yeah this young person would have been to say, oh, yeah. wow, I get to have God speak directly to me and have yeah. my very own blood. Like how excited this I know. person must have been for this. And fully believing it. That's the thing, fully believing and being old enough. You know, when you're 16, you're like, ah, oh, whatever. I got mine when I was 16. You know, I was only worried in my blessing about, is it going to say I'm going to get married? <laughs> like most 16 year olds, right? You want to hear that. Come on, say it. Come on, say it. You know? So, but you're right. This is a young adult and they 
more fully understand if they believe in this, what this is. It's an absolutely incredible experience that they obviously want very badly. So, all right, let's see what happens next in our story that a colleague brought to our uh, speaker's attention. So I'll read this one. Uh, when this young single adult realized she um, that she was being asked to wear a skirt or a, a dress or a skirt, she went to the bishop and said that she would not. She also told the state president, state patriarch, that she wouldn't come in a skirt or a dress because it shouldn't matter what she wore. Well, how dare she, right? How dare she make that statement that it shouldn't matter what she wore? <laughs> Some would argue that she was right. I just did. However, the patriarch felt that he should kindly but decidedly decline to give the blessing under those circumstances. He asked her again, explaining that because this is such a sacred experience, would she please come dressed in a skirt or a dress just as she would if she were going to the temple? Who wants to take this one on first? Landon, Melissa, <laughs> flip a coin. I know you're both like... Well, Landon, what do you think? Well, I think uh, if if the a skirt or a dress is okay for going to the temple, then someone who is male who identifies as female should be able to wear a skirt or a dress and have the same feeling if it's Boom. the clothes that make the difference. There so you said it. Why couldn't she wear a suit uh, if she identified as a male uh, and that would still funnel gods because it does for a male why wouldn't it funnel it for a female <laughs> according to their uh you know uh thinking here they're thinking exactly, exactly. what do you think Melissa? All this young adult <laughs> would need to do would wear a suit and tie and it would meet the requirements of dressing for the temple if yep. they had worn a suit and tie it would have been fine it would have been suit and temple attire it would have been temple attire Yep. No, you're absolutely right. The thing that stood out to me, of course, is the patriarch. He's kind, but he knows he has to lay down the law. You can do it kindly, but you have to decidedly. Can you imagine? He literally says to this young person who desires so greatly this blessing, I won't do it. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how, how that compelled. person have felt at that moment. He's, He's compelled, compelled again. He's compelled. And, and I've I believe that actually breaks your uh, priesthood oath that uh, when someone asks for you to to use your priesthood uh, on their behalf, that you don't get to decline that. I mean, think if somebody is, you know, sick and uh, injured and they want a blessing and you say, nah, I just don't feel right about giving a blessing to you while you're there dying. You, you know, if you're a priesthood holder, God's given that power for you to serve others. And you, you don't get to choose whether you're going to withhold your uh, priesthood duty. And that that's what caught me on this one as I'm going, what right does he have to refuse to give a blessing that the bishop has interviewed her and found her worthy? So she's got the recommend. So the bishop has said she's wor she or he, whichever pronoun we want to use in this case, is worthy to receive the blessing. And then the patriarch says, well, I'm, I'm declining anyway, even though you have the recommend, I'm declining. It says something about a bishop's power. You know what I mean? Would, the he bishop would be her judge. Power. The bishop would yeah. be her yeah, judge. Yeah, the bishop yes. is the judge, yeah. Yes, but superseded by the power of the kindly, yet decidedly <laughs> declining patriarch. So yeah, there's a lot of things wrong with this paragraph right here. Because then that's making the patriarch judge, jury, and executioner, essentially. He's exactly. like, yeah. I'm yep. deciding that you don't get this thing when it's not really within his purview. Is that, well, I, I don't know. I Apparently don't. here it is. Apparently he needs to school everyone involved who, as the fourth line says, thinks it shouldn't matter what she wore. That's really what we need to learn here. It does matter. It matters very much to the point where he will withhold his priesthood power from this young person until she's in line with outward appearance. A very How about the interesting. Some would thought. argue that she was right. It yeah, makes it what, almost yeah. be like some would argue. That it's she very was snarky. Right. It's, that's what I'm saying. And, and I they're calling out the bishop too, because the bishop thought she was right. The bishop knew how this individual liked, you know, dressed or who they were and said, go ahead. So, so you're right. This whole story is also not just about the young person, but as we'll get into later, everybody that may support the young person's um, and, and what they're doing and who they are. 
the, that word there, some would argue that that's a, we see this all the time in church yeah. literature. So they never say word. who those some are. I mean, <laughs> what if that some is a general authority of the 70 who said that it was okay? Mm, what if no. it was one of the apostles who said it was okay? No. Because we often see where a prophet says something and they, they would then say, some said this. Well, that was the prophet that said that, but they don't want to say it was the prophet who said that. So they make right. it, they, they change it to this nebulous sum. Um, and right. and it case, gives a lot of weight. It gives a lot of weight behind it because then the person you're arguing with or explaining goes, oh, there are some, you know, there's this power behind it. People feel this way, you know, or don't feel this way. Maybe I should too. It's a, it's a persuasion tactic sort of. Well, well I think another part of it is when it says someone argue that she is right, you're supposed to like, you know, put yourself in that situation. Right. Would I be one of those people who is no, going no. against no. the patriarch? Would I be one yeah. of those people who was saying that it shouldn't matter? Would I be one of those people who was going against what God is compelling me to do? And you're kind of putting yourself yeah. in that situation by saying some, she's asking you to put yourself in that scenario and what would you do in that scenario exactly and it also has to do with the delivery because in the talk and i can't remember i've listened to it a couple of times but if she were to say some would argue she was right you know in that voice <laughs> that, that right voice. away tells you you that horror i know i can't believe i can do it i kind of scared myself <laughs> but you know what i mean the delivery of it tells Nailed you it. That, that is the wrong yeah i'm not proud of it yeah. um, but, but that is the <laughs> wrong tactic to take so yeah it's also in the delivery of the story and as a as a professional storyteller which this woman is. And I would say that a lot of our leadership, when we hear them address us in meetings and conference, they are also professional storytellers in the way that they craft it to definitely get their point across just by inflection, mannerisms, you know, it's not necessarily what's being said, but the way it's being said, and it's pretty clear to everybody. So, all right, let's move on to the, I know everyone's probably like, this is a horrible story and I'm sorry, but this is why when we read it, we just felt we needed to talk about it. We just had to. We, we are compelled just to continue. Be. Again, we are compelled. Here we go. And I think it's uh, Landon's turn to read the next uh, paragraph. Okay. The girl and her friends, including other fellow ward members, were angry. They scoffed at the request and pushed back because it didn't affirm what was important to her. Even the bishop sided with the girl and said that he didn't agree with the request either. He thought the stake president was making too big of a deal about her clothing, that he was old school, and the bishop was just glad that she even wanted to get a patriarchal blessing and couldn't understand why the patriarch didn't feel the same way. Shouldn't showing up be enough? Oh, there you go. Melissa, you want to tackle this one first? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I had to Melissa. start with girl. I'm like, yeah, and that's the thing. Girl, woman, she, her. There's not a single uh, feminine uh, pronoun or, or phrase that they're not using here to just well, because drive their then point you're home. not only you're not only putting a feminine identity on her. You're also putting her in a immature category. Yes, yes. she's you're a not 20 year old. Only... She's an adult. The young person is an adult, yes. Right, so you're not only um, misgendering how she feels, you're also uh, being insulting. So yeah, I, yeah. I yeah. just like- oh. and, and let's clarify, a 20-year-old is a woman, not a girl. Yes, a woman, not a girl. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. So, and I just love how they go down the gamut here. So people in the ward thought that this young person should be able to get a blessing. The bishop thought that this young person should be able to get a blessing and they all pushed back against authority. They all pushed back because they cared about the girl, the young person, and they wanted her to, they wanted the young person to have uh, what they, what they wanted to have. So, but this, I also read sort of in a snarky tone, a warning tone. Look at all these people and what they're doing. It's not right. That's kind of how I read it. Well, yeah. and when you listen to her, when she gets to that very last line where it says, shouldn't showing up be yeah. enough, you would think you would have yeah. asked it, shouldn't showing up be enough? You, yeah, you know, no. you would think you would have you would have had that inflection where it would be a question. No, yeah. she said it. She did not say it with any inflection right. that it was a question. So, you know, it's putting that. Are you one of those people who mm -hmm. thinks that showing up should be enough? Are you one of those? It's mm -hmm. just that implicit. You know, are you one of the yes. check yourself kind bad of a ones. thing? She's yeah, not you doing better check you're yourself. Doing. And, yeah, and, and that's fact, what's interesting. Oh, go ahead, Landon. It's got a period at the end. It's not a question. It's a statement. 
Uh, well, I, 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 that's what I, cause I, I was doing it off of what she was saying. And so when I listened to her say that like three times, I'm like, that was not a question. And then I listened to it again. Yeah. She did not inflect question when she said yeah. it. She didn't. She made it. Yeah. Period. So yeah. Uh, I, I think it's punctuation it's, matters. <laughs> yes, it absolutely does. Um, uh, and, and I, I can see this, this uh, person is a, a convert. So they don't know all of these things. And this is supposed to be a roadmap for their life. So they're just starting this journey. They're supposed to get a roadmap for their life. And instead you say, nope, you you haven't conformed at all. You don't you you haven't bought into our way. Therefore, you don't get the roadmap to tell you how to go forward. Uh because simply because you won't you, you have to dress. It's right from the start. You have to you have to you must dress. Go the line and look like us and act like us and be like us, or you don't get the blessing that's going to be the roadmap for your life. And how? Why would you want to refuse something to someone who would who you believe that this is an important thing they need to to progress in their life? And you say, no, you don't get it. Uh, we're we're not giving it to you. Well, they use it as a weapon. And yeah. and I have a story about a friend who went in after work for a Temple Recommend interview. This is the same kind of story. They were wearing a, a business pants suit because they were a professional. It was a woman. And they turned her away. They said, you cannot have a Temple Recommend interview. She looked nicer than the bishop in his scruffy khakis and, you know, untucked shirt. She was in a professional woman's business suit. They wouldn't let her do it. And Think about what that means. They're not going to let her have the saving ordinances or get her, you know, go through the temple simply because of what she was wearing on the outside of her body. And there was a little back and forth kind of playing chicken. You know, she was asking all of us, what should I do? I feel like I want to stand my ground. And they were standing their ground. Eventually she caved. She put on a skirt. She went back to the interview. But when you really think about what they're holding over your head, it is life and death. It's the most important thing in their world that you can do. Go to the temple, get a patriarchal blessing. This is all the covenant path. They are blocking you on the covenant path. And the other thing I noticed about this particular paragraph is that in the past, a story like this might just be against the young person, that they were mistaken. But here, I think they're following sort of what's happening now, patterns in wards and stakes. The bishop agrees with the young person. The people in the ward are willing to fight for the young person. I think you see this because you're in close proximity with people. You're not going to other them. You know them. You love them. You are going to fight for them. And so in this story, they're calling out everybody that is rallying for this young person, the bishop, the ward members, everyone. And that's different, I think, than you've seen in stories before. So I think they realize this is what's happening. We're refusing to other people, even in wards and stakes. We're not going to do it anymore. So, yeah, they're they're not giving um, bishops or other ward members an mm -hmm. opportunity to protect these individuals. Yes. They're saying stop. Saving oh, them, yeah. stop protecting them. I they're mocking this, them kind of, for doing it. It's kind of almost like the musket fire thing. Like stop. Yeah. Like let's start aiming at these people. Start. Yeah. You know, it's just it's basically compelling them to stop protecting yeah. people. That's the word of the day. Compel. That's it. So all right. Well, maybe this will have a happy ending. Let's keep reading. <laughs> is it? Is I think it's Melissa's turn. Is it your yeah. turn, Melissa? I can't remember. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Nonetheless, the bishop Nonetheless. Oh. and it came to pass. Nonetheless, the bishop suggested that maybe she just wear the skirt so that she could get her blessing. Humbly, she agreed to wear a skirt and went to the state patriarch's home, where he and his wife greeted her with sincere love and kindness. Oh, see, I I compare this to the first time she went. The young person went went in for the instructions and was probably fairly sternly told, you're going to have to dress like we want you to dress or I'm not going to do it. But now look, the tables have turned. The young person has humbly agreed to put on the attire that they have been told to wear. And now their sincere love, is it though? Is it sincere love when it's that conditional? And kindness. So well, that's my thought. And then Melissa had a lot of thoughts about the word humbly. Let's talk about that. <laughs> How right does she there. Know? How does she know? I get 
that she's telling a story, but unless you're telling the story from like your perspective, how do you know how she felt about it? Maybe she was really livid, Get like, fine, I will wear a dress instead of a suit and tie, but this is not making, like, how do you know it was humbly? Like, it just the implication that it's, they know her fra- their frame of mind when they were doing it is just a little frustrating to me because this whole story implies that they know where this young adult was coming from. And I just, that makes me cranky too. I, I know that's part of storytelling, but that's why we're going to talk about storytelling. Story well, it later. means something. It's a very loaded word. And there's a huge gap there between- Very loaded you know, well, First of all, I have, yeah. First of all, I have to say, look, her ally or the young person's ally, the bishop, um, just said, oh, come on, just, you know, can you just do it? Is it okay? So, you know, they sent in someone she trusted to convince her, the young person to do it. And then this huge gap between could get her blessing, period. And then there's this gap. What happened in between that gap before humbly? What mindset, what thinking of this poor young person having to weigh it? Like you said, I, I guess I've got to do it. Even the bishop is telling me I've got to do it. I've got to sort I of leave my identity. Yeah, I got to check my identity, who I am at the door in order to get this. And so to me, there's a huge chasm right there before the word humbly. And I can only imagine the mental anguish that went on right there before the young person humbly put on a dress. What do you think, Landon? Yeah, I, I think there was probably a, a lot of, I don't know if hatred's the right word, but very uh, passionate feelings about someone making you do this to, mm-hmm. to something that is not who you are. And and I wonder, you know, wear the skirt, uh, you know, since she's female and this, you know, they're using the term female uh, for her to wear the skirt. Um, what if we were in Scotland? Would a guy be able to wear the, the kilt? What if we were in the uh, island nations where they wear those uh, long uh, wraps uh, as with their shirt and tie? They're not wearing pants as a male. They're wearing a skirt, basically, or, you know, more like that. So, again, different cultures have a, a skirt may be male in one culture. It may and pants may be feminine in another culture there there's only one culture the culture of utah is the only culture that matters here uh and so she's business attire business attire (laughs) is the only acceptable yep but the the one that really hit me here was the sincere love and kindness uh they they were saying (laughs) don't come to our house and and expect a blessing uh unless and then as soon as she puts a skirt on come sit we love you Oh, what a humble, sincere sister. Uh, they're all of a sudden, they they completely changed their demeanor because simply she changed her clothing. Yeah, you said it. You said it right there. So Okay, uh, so can I talk about sincere love? Oh, yes, of course, please. <laughs> I want to talk about sincere love. So um, this is um, kind of a... Uh, little parable from my gay friend who told me that when you are with somebody who sincerely loves you it doesn't feel bad right so if you're like in an ocean you're dying of thirst you want water and there's water everywhere they're sincerely loving you they're greeting you they're welcoming you come sit on our couch here have this drink here we love you we're kind have a have a drink with some cookies you know and they're just throwing all this love at you but when you're drinking the water it's filled with salt, right? And this salt water, when you're drinking it, they're like, we love you, have some more water. And you're drinking the salt. And what does salt water do to your body? It leaves you dehydrated. It breaks your body down from the inside. It is killing you from the inside when you're drinking this sincere love and kindness. It's not helping you. It's not feel, it doesn't feel good. What feels good is if he had said, I love you, I accept you and who and how you are, and I would love to welcome you into my home, however you choose to show up. That is sincere love. That is pure love. That is not love with boundaries and caveats to it. It feels different. I know that it feels different because when I was a believing Mormon person, 
I did put caveats on my love. I did the love the person, hate the sin. I thought those things in order to make it all work in my head. I know it feels different when I love somebody sincerely with pureness and when I'm loving them with expectations. It feels different for us and for them. That is a great way to say it. And I love that analogy of you're surrounded with love, aren't you? Like the ocean, but it's it's not the kind of love that sustains you or does anything for you. And you can tell the difference. So, well, they think it's yeah. sincere, right? They really do think it's sincere right. love and kindness. They really, truly right. believe it is. But when you're on the receiving end of it, yes, you're dying of dehydration because it's killing you. It's not love that's filling you at all. And until they yeah. can figure that out, I mean, there's just, it's sad because LD, LGBTQ people will not feel welcome in the church with this kind of love and kindness. They never will. Right. Not with conditions, like you said, that you stated it very well. So, all right, maybe there's still some hope. Let's get to the rest. Of that. Okay. Uh, what followed next was the sweetest and most tender experience for whatever heavenly father instructed this faithful state patriarch to bless her with changed everything that sacred moment changed her life it changed her heart she now understood who she truly was who she had always been a beloved daughter of heavenly parents with a sacred mission potential identity and purpose and from that moment on she immediately embraced her divine femininity wow (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we're all speechless here. Sorry. If you're just listening and not watching, you'll just, our faces are like, we can't even speak at all at the, I can't even go first. Somebody else take it. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, the, the, the fact that it says the sacred moment changed her life. It changed her heart as if there was something wrong with her heart before, uh, that she was what in, in, uh, you know, against God or something, because she felt that she was someone else. Uh, it, it seems like what it changed is it changed her or who she thought she was. She conformed to what she was told she had to be. Uh, that does not sound sincere at all. It makes it sound like she completely changed everything to uh, make these people happier to, 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 to conform so that she could get something that they told her she must have. Uh, and so she changed it. But to to go on and say, oh, wow, she immediately embraced her divine femininity. That makes like the that. story seem almost completely unbelievable. That someone who felt that way, that they're dressing a certain way, that they're using certain pronouns, all of a sudden flips like a switch just because of a blessing. Yet we're not told what, you know, it says, Whatever, Heavenly Father, boy, it's too I, sacred yeah, to share. I, I like to know what that was. was that was said that yeah. flipped the switch. That that would, flipped the switch. Every bishop want to know that if the desire is to to that we have to fix these young people that are like, right. then why not tell what the wording was that completely changed this person's life? But it's not in there, which makes it again suspect as did this really even happen? Uh, Could because, it really happen? Yeah, nothing. Yeah, and I was just oh. noticing that we never really know this young person because it's just a she and a girl the whole time. We don't know this young person. When I read this story, that's all I think about is this person is, you know, a girl, uh, uh, she, a her. I don't know this person by the end of the story. And at the end, this person has just come back full circle to what they told this person that they were the entire time. So the person is lost. The young person is lost in this entire story. So go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> I know you're having a hard time. It's, it's really rough. So I, I get caught up on understood who she truly was <laughs> like the person she was before was fake. Right. It wasn't real. Wasn't true. Right. And who she had always been also implies that who she was before was wrong. Okay. So here's my whole thing with this and I'm sorry for the tangent, but when I people are trying to find which gender best fits them, it is not necessarily a linear path, right? It is for some people, not for everybody. So is there a chance that she 
is trying out to see how she like she something feels strange in her body so she's trying out different genders to see how she feels that's totally legitimate right like i'm trying to figure out who and how you are and how you feel and what gender fits how you feel inside i get that i get trying to figure it out trying to discover it but to say that there's a truly and an always in that experience is to deny and to ignore the process of figuring it out right however somebody's going to end up when they do say this is the gender that i feel identifies me to have a truly and an always implies that there's a wrong answer and there isn't a wrong answer because it's internal right it's it what's inside of you so saying that there is a truly or an always is to deny the experience of feeling or learning where you fall in that category because it is not an easy linear path for everybody it is not intuitive for everybody it just isn't no i think that's really good and and i i love how they keep referring to the stake patriarch as faithful he was the one the entire time that had the answer and saw the vision and he stuck to it he faced you know adversity as ward members and bishops came to him and tried to shake what he knew but he was faithful he was right what he did changed this young person's life got this young person back in line so that's a message too that you need to stay the course even though people may be coming at you and going what are you doing why are you saying it this way so that faithful he's always referred to as faithful kind you know direct all the different words they use for him he's the one that's on the right path and he sees the big picture they, they, i have another complaint oh, yeah sorry. oh here we go another complaint go ahead another complaint heavenly father instructed yeah. this yeah. faithful state patriarch right no no i um that's implying that the you know, obviously in, in the LDS world, that is what they believe that the patriarch is speaking directly to heavenly father. I, this is basically why I left the church because I could not accept. Shoot. I wasn't going to cry on this one. I could not accept. (laughs) I always cry that a loving heavenly father would do this to his LGBTQ kids. I couldn't. And so this heavenly father is telling this patriarch to tell this young adult who she truly was and who she always had been. It just, I, I can't, I just, I can't. They, They are putting authority in it. I'm allowed to tell you who you are. I'm allowed to tell you how you're supposed to identify. I have the ability and the authority to tell you how you are supposed to feel in your own body (laughs) i just i can't i just ah, (laughs) yeah exactly we need a lot of zen moments to get through this no that's such a valid point lisa (laughs) it's really not just the patriarch in this everybody knows it's actually god himself that is saying this to this young person through the patriarch and that makes it all the more just i think horrible landon what do you think they, they really threw the bishop under the bus here because evidently mm-hmm. the bishop doesn't get instructions from Heavenly mm-hmm. Father. So why should we go to our bishop uh, for anything if uh, he, he he evidently the feelings he got were incorrect and weren't led by Heavenly Father? So they kind of left themselves in a bit of a bind that one priesthood leader gets one answer and another priesthood leader gets a different answer but only one of them is faithful answer. The other one is not a faithful answer. Uh, how do you know that the that this uh, young person wasn't getting a faithful answer from God as to what they were supposed to be doing? And then, uh, you know, they changed because someone else said something. It's it's It really leaves them in a bind where one church leader thinks one thing and one thinks another and now they're telling you only one of those people was was faithful and right and how do you know how do you know how do you know yeah the other problem i have with the entire story is that if there is a family member who does not understand a young person like this this gives them some kind of idea that eventually there could be some intervention and something could happen it's like a false 
hope, a false narrative. And I think we see that with these kind of cherry picked stories. Well, look, it happened for them. Maybe it can happen for me if there's something that, you know, you're trying, that you're not understanding in a loved one or a relative. And you have this idea that everything can change and, and that this is, this is a false hope. And it's, I think it's irresponsible because it's going to cause problems in relationships. It, it does say that. It says from that moment on, mm -hmm. she immediately, immediately mm -hmm. embraced her divine feminine. Mm -hmm. So in perpetuity, for the rest of forever, <laughs> she has embraced it. She will never question her gender or her identity yeah. ever again. Problem solved right there. Problem solved. Yeah. So these kinds of stories. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of those. Um, and a lot of them start out like like that. I got a letter or I had a friend or something. And then the story has this kind of a moral. Okay, let's go to the next and slide. And then I think we'll talk happened. about. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, I think we're Landon's turn. I don't know. Yep. I'm all off. But let's go ahead, Landon. Okay. Like the Savior's disciple, this faith-filled young convert answered his call. And he saith unto her, follow me. And she straightway left her nets and followed him. The patriarch, in spite of ridicule and pressure, did the same. Our children and youth need such stories of conviction and humility. As leaders, we need stories that teach us how to speak truth and love. I look forward to subsequent opportunities to teach more about the art of crafting and telling stories. And that's the 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 uh, the, the speaker who is saying that part. Right. Right. And, and it does go on past this a little bit, but this is kind of where this section ends. So she just compares it to the parable of, um, you know, dropping your nets and following the savior. Also talks about the patriarch as being someone, like I said before, who has done this against all adversity. He stayed the course and he was able to pull this young person into the light. Um, and then, of, and, and the other part that really speaks to what the entire talk was about. As leaders, we need stories that teach us how to speak love, truth and love. So that means the stories that help you to say these hard, hateful, in many cases, things to young people in a way that it's, you know, kind of, it's almost like an inoculation, right? It's, it's kind of pleasant to hear it the way the story leads you down this path. And through a story, you're just not being so overt so someone can di object directly you just hear this story and you're kind of left with, well, I'm not quite sure what it said. What did it mean? So storytelling is powerful. And as she said at the end here, um, I, I think there's a workshop component talking to people about how to learning, learn how to tell stories, create stories from your own experiences in life that are teaching moments um, and tell stories. So maybe we can talk a little bit just about stories, especially stories in the church and their use. Um, and I don't know, talks, meetings, lessons. It's a big part of being in the church, these stories. So Lana, do you have any thoughts on that to start? Yeah, uh, my my first thought is, is, is the story true? That that becomes real important. If, if you're saying, oh, let's make up a story to prove a point, but there's no actual facts behind it, the fact that there's no facts to back up the story makes the story you know, useless. Um, it, it useless. has to, yep. it has to have some basis in fact, did this really happen? And we're never told whether the, the, the way this is woven into this story, we, 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 it's a, she's talking about telling stories. So we don't know if this is a story that she made up to tell this, or if this is an actual story. And to me, that's really important to know whether this is a factual, actual story or not. I think uh, in, in our book club, anyone who's read the book Sapiens, uh, we mm -hmm. learned that all humans have a myth. Everyone has a story behind them, and everyone believes a different myth. People have different myths. That's their story. And not all of your myths are true. It's just what you believe in. But it's important to realize whether it's true or not, because if your myth is not true, it's no more valid than my myth. So... I can make the myth that I'm my gender is male or female. I can make a, a a decision and say this is my truth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone else is has the same truth. They can be what they choose. Everyone's got a story. I, I think this I'm the one who writes my own story. <laughs> uh oh, Len is starting to sing. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> you gotta let people you, you gotta let people have their own story. And this is one where they basically took 
this person's story and changed it to a different story. <laughs> she Completely. rewrote the story to, to say, this is how the story should have ended. And we're going to make it end that way to fit the narrative that we want to make so that we can make other people believe our story. That's right. It was crafted. I think that's the word right there, crafted. crafted. And I had the thought, the colleague, did the colleague invent or embellish the story who then told it we all played the telephone game when we were younger and that's exactly what happens and i noticed i know Kimberly said this and this yep and i noticed uh, recently there was a, a talk that um president oaks gave a youth fireside and there was huh, there was a lot to unpack in that maybe we'll do an episode on that but there was one part where he read a letter from a girl a young another a teenager named amy who was concerned about these same issues of gender and the way society was going and wanted the church to speak out more strongly which a lot of people said no teenager would write a letter like this you know is it just a device is it a way that you don't have to get up there and say look i think we need to be harder on this or is it easier to say oh, you know, I got this letter or I heard it. I mean, I think back to Holland and the musket talk. And he said, I received letters from donors who told me this. And then you're able to get that point across, but you're removed a little bit. So it doesn't come across as aggressively, but you're again, getting your point across. And we have no idea if there's an Amy. We don't know if there's this young person. We have no idea. We're just left with this story in a vacuum. What do you think, Melissa? I Here's my problem with, as Landon was saying, about using it to speak truth, because if you're presenting this story as a factual, this actually happened, it's giving an, an LDS mindset. It might give hope or it right. might give um, a perception that this is actually a possibility when mm -hmm. the possibility of this actually happening are pretty close to infinitesimal, right? It's the, the 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 likelihood that this person would have a complete utter immediate change of heart that would last for the rest of their life probably did not actually happen but if you're presenting it as this is a possibility this happened to this person this is then people have oh my friend can change my neighbor right. can change my kid can change my sibling can change look it happened to them it could happen to her my family too and so it gives yeah. this false hope if that's what you're hoping for in that culture it gives this false narrative that is not necessarily achievable is it is there a small percentage could it possibly happen yes i i won't say that it has never happened and it will never happen i i can't say that because you know in a, in a in a world there's always that zero percent chance right that one percent chance yeah. zero anything point can one. happen yeah. it could happen is it likely no is it yeah it, and so when you're putting it forth as a possibility it negates the lived experience of the majority of people in the, the similar situation is my problem yeah no i i see that absolutely and i have to say that um on in the post-mormon world um, you can't get away very often with telling a story or even saying, I heard this or because everybody, <laughs> they're like, give me your source, give me your facts, show me where this came from, give me the provenance. You know, have you guys both noticed that, that you, you've got to give the footnotes. You can't just randomly say, oh, I had a cousin who said this or heard this. Everybody kind of pounces on you. And I appreciate that. I mean, that's happened to me before. I've said, I, I heard this and they're like, where, what, why? But you know what? That means that you get more to the heart of things and more to the truth. And any thoughts on that? No, I agree. Yeah. I'd love to know who who is this who is this mm -hmm. young person? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, tell us tell us their name. Bring them forth. I would think this would be a, if if she truly had this conversion that she would want to tell her story. Uh, so let do they have permission or consent to tell this story? That's yeah. what I wonder too. Do yep. they, you know, do they have permission or consent to share this story? That's problematic. And I'm guessing as she shared it, she would not say things like the bishop and the ward members scoffed at the stake yeah. patriarch. Like, it, it was, no, 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 it's, this is not it's her very, story. Yeah. It's very deliberate, the choices of words in this type of scenario. And it's not a direct story. The words chosen are very deliberate Yeah, because not, they I'm, have that artistic license to use words deliberately like that like adding in the humility adding in the 
scoffing like mm -hmm. very deliberate word choices that that's a great point if 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 this uh young lady was telling the story i'm sure it would be told completely different mm -hmm. so if it's told different by the person it happened to then this person's really taking the facts and making them fit their yes the conclusion that they need you to come to and that's can we why use the word crafting <laughs> which is right there on the so screen crafting, crafting right yep. Crafting for purposes. Yeah. But that just shows you how important stories are. And we all grew up with all of them. I mean, think of Paul H. Dunn, right? I, you're probably not old enough, Melissa, but Landon and I are. He was the man. I mean, his stories were amazing. I remember driving, you know, hours to go to a fireside that he was going to talk at. But even, even when I was younger, I remember thinking, that seems... I don't know could that have happened you know but everyone around you is having these amazing warm feelings and then you later find out no it probably didn't happen oh. so stories are extremely powerful and you don't forget them at all and we see them every time in conference yeah, every time there's a story but i know they're crafted i have an example of a family member who submitted a story to the then ensign right or enzyme people always people write me notes it's enzyme no it's ensign there's different ways to pronounce it we found out right landon in the united states and in the uk yes so anyway the church publication so the story was about um his ancestor who was a woman a polygamous wife on a wagon train and she had adventures and the church publication said we will publish this but you can't say that she's a polygamous wife she has to be a single woman a widow with a child traveling and then you can tell all of her experiences and stories but you can't tell anybody that she was actually just the second wife of one of the men on the wagon train. So isn't that interesting how that was crafted? How convenient. To, how convenient. And so he said, no, I don't really want to do that. Her story is that she was the second wife. So they didn't publish it. Um, as I remember, they didn't publish it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, crafted, completely different story. And so sometimes you read these and you think this seems very sanitized. This seems like it's really trying to get to a certain trajectory, a certain point and take the audience with them which you see i think in conference and meetings and sacrament meeting and everywhere yeah we saw we that with our buzzword. president yes. nelson <laughs> Compel. Where, yeah with president nelson and his story of the airplane that uh uh when the spiral of death spiraling death and there was flames coming out of the engine yeah. and they landed in an emergency in a farmer's field and it turned out that uh it was a both engines continued to run. It made a standard landing at a, at an airport on the runway. There was never any danger, yet it didn't sound like he was a hero who feared death unless it was a death spiral with a burning engine. So he added that, <laughs> that element to it to make it sound like he didn't fear death because right. he was a man of God. And that makes right, but then he spoke for the other people on the plane. Yes. They were not necessarily as faithful and they were terrified. They were, they terrified. were afraid of the afterlife. How do you know that? How do you know it all? You know, you don't. But in the story, everyone else was afraid because they were not faithful. The faithful were the ones that had no fear in the death spiral. So again, it, crafted. Yeah. And it's a great example of why the truth of the story matters. Because mm -hmm. when it's not, an, when it's just a, in fact, the airplane didn't even declare an emergency. They just made mm -hmm. a precautionary landing and landed off off the airport or on at the airport but that that just goes to show you that that now is not a great faith promoting story because it didn't happen they made it a faith promoting story right which when you find that out destroys your faith and you go there exactly you have to make up a story to make a faith promoting story that 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 just leads to the wrong place well well now they're playing it more safe though because now the faith promoting is crushing a water bottle i mean there, there's not too much you exaggerate <laughs> about that they, they're done with that really big happen? grandiose story well it may not have really happened that's true but it seems way more plausible <laughs> that someone could crush a water bottle more plausible than the burning spiral of death and if our viewers or listeners have not heard of this story that's been used many many times by president nelson mormonism live rfm and bill real did a really good treatment of this i don't know the episode number but i I think it's called careening out of control spiral of death fight it's anyway they did a whole debunking of this entire story so yeah but you know and i understand though the temptation to tell a story that sounds good and i know that sometimes when you tell a story over and over you naturally embellish it there are all these 
memory things at play. There are things that you can remember differently. You tend to embellish. I, I understand that's human nature. You know, it absolutely is. But irresponsible in a case like this where, you know, it, it's lives and the way people live their lives. And it's it's just a whole different scenario. So, all right. Any final thoughts? And then I think we'll wrap this up. It's been very interesting to discuss this this talk. I actually do because, like I said, going back with our buzzword today, compel, um, where she says, as leaders, so this is your job. You're supposed to compel them. You're supposed to have stories that teach us how to speak truth. And it was like Landon was saying, whose truth? Like this young adult felt their truth was how they identified. So whose truth is it that you are supposed to be speaking? Because like I said, when I was crying, their truth saying that gender is eternal or binary is not true. Their truth that um, sexuality is binary, also not true. So, I mean, if you're looking at it from a specifically a scientific perspective, you're speaking not truths, you're lying, right? You're speaking lies to these people, but you're putting it in a guise of truth and you're calling it truth when it is not truth and as somebody who felt like I had been lied to for 45 years I am all about truth I am about verifying I am about science I'm about facts like you guys are saying what can you prove what can you verify what can you see that's the truth I want that's the truth I need so unless and until God himself says gender is binary, sex is binary. There is nothing you can show me that will have a truth because all of the things that I see, science, experience, friends, family, all of these things, all of the lived experiences that I have, that truth is the opposite of what they are trying to compel these leaders to teach. And so I have issues with the word truth in that. I just, I... No, I need science. I need facts because I was lied to for 45 years about what truth is. I will not accept anything less than factual evidence anymore. I won't. But these wow, people well are supposed to said. teach it as a story and embellish right. what they consider truth. Yeah, I just, oh. Yeah, no, you hit it right on the head there. Landon, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think what I've learned from this is um, that stories are exactly that they're stories uh as you said a, a great storyteller is someone who's able to embellish and able to make something sound more significant or more uh, uh i guess significant would be the right word than it really mm -hmm. was and that's the sign of a great storyteller but just because they tell a story doesn't mean that it's accurate or true and that we have to step back and look at a story. We can't just take it because stories are nice. They're anecdotal. You know, you, you, you say, Oh yes, that, that's a great way to express that. Or it's a great way to get it. So they can be a good way to, 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 to get a, a concept across, but we need to stand back and ask ourselves, is that story true? Or is that story representative? Uh, because like Melissa said, uh, for one letter, could this have happened? Okay, I'll grant you this could have happened, but it's certainly not the norm. And to use one story to say that eh, everything is this way because this one time it happened when 200 times other times the child went home and committed suicide or did something harmful to themselves because of the way they were treated in this. And that's that's what we need to to, to look at. So- it's I'd look dangerous. at the stories that we learned growing up, you know, uh, this doesn't line up with what I learned that Jesus would have done. I couldn't see Jesus going up <laughs> and going around and, 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 and not, not blessing somebody because they weren't, you know, I'm not going to cast the devil out of you because you're not wearing your suit and tie. Uh, no. You know, it, it doesn't match the stories I learned growing up. And so we've got to look at them as stories. I think that's a very good point. So this has been this has been a very interesting episode and I appreciate everybody being really real and vulnerable as we talk about this. And um, I'd like to know what our viewers and our listeners think. Leave us some comments. Um, we'll put the link 
link to this talk if you want to listen to the entire thing um, or just kind of fast forward toward the end where this actual story is, is told. I would love to hear what all of you think about this. If you draw some of the same conclusions or if you you know, have some other thoughts or feelings on it, um, especially since this is Pride Month. I think that we're all thinking about this. Mormonish is going to the Salt Lake Pride Parade. I know this is one of the signs we're taking and we have a banner. So if you, if anyone's in the area um, at the parade, it's going to be on Sunday at 10 a.m., come and find us. We would love to say hello to any of our viewers and listeners. So we want to thank Melissa again. She's a wonderful friend and a wonderful guest. And we just appreciate everything she has to say. She's just so wise. And I think an old soul. She's just amazing. She's one of our favorite people. So thank you again, Melissa, for being on. And don't forget, everybody, to like and to subscribe. And I actually have a kind of an exciting announcement. I always laugh about we don't have a donor button. Well, we don't actually have a button, but we have <laughs> we do have a link to PayPal or to Venmo where if you would like to support Mormonish podcast, um, you can. And we appreciate our viewers and listeners so much. So you can look for those links in the show notes to any of our videos or in our description of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And also don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you can be notified when our new episodes come out. And we will say good night and happy Pride Month to everybody from Mormonish and Melissa. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.